I'ma crush it. Call me. Welcome to Unsung, Pittsburgh's nonprofit news magazine show. As always, I'm your host, Anthony Walker, potential future mayor of Pittsburgh. We're out spending this beautiful spring day down next to the smokestacks in the waterfront and maybe some time on the riverbank. The Unsung team had a blast at the Hollywood Theater and we encourage you to check it out and join them for one of their upcoming events. Today's Unsung is about survival. Christopher brings you the story of a cancer survivor and St. Vincent College introduces you to the Student Emergency Fund, plus news and events from our area nonprofit organizations. Let's get started. Cultural organizations across the U.S. are experimenting with how they can attract and serve increasingly diverse audiences, including patrons with special needs. In New York City, Theater Development Fund broke new ground by sponsoring a performance of The Lion King, especially tailored for children on the autism spectrum and their families. This fall, Pittsburgh will become just the second city to present an autism-friendly Broadway touring production. Pittsburgh Cultural Trust will present Disney's The Lion King as part of its PNC Broadway Across America Pittsburgh series. One matinee, Saturday, September 21st, will be tailored for children with autism spectrum disorder and their families. For more information and tickets, please visit the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust's website at trustarts.org. The Carnegie Museum of Art announced the late April launch of a Lazy Worm Play sculpture among the trees near the museum's main entrance at Forbes Avenue and Craig Street. The Lazy Worm is a colorful, twisting, tubular play structure designed by Swiss artist Ivan Pestalozzi in 1972. This is the first U.S. installation of a Lazy Worm and it will be open to the public. The Lazy Worm is one of several projects leading up to the 2013 Carnegie International, which opens October 5th, 2013. It reflects the International's explicit engagement with the city of Pittsburgh, the museum's public, and the conceptions of play. We all agreed that this exhibition would not drop on the city from out of nowhere, but would be developed in exchange with Pittsburgh, its people, and its urban fabric, said Daniel Bauman, one of three co-curators, along with Dan Byers and Tina Kakowski, the playground together with the apartment in Lawrenceville that is a site for informal events, the CI13 blog, and exhibition components in other parts of the city. We'll deepen this engagement with Pittsburgh as it also explores play as the foundation of thinking, making, and experimentation, a key animating concept of the 2013 Carnegie International. The museum expects to break ground in mid-February and open the play structure in late April 2013, creating a place where families can gather and where children from all backgrounds in all parts of the city can play and interact. Surprising, welcoming, and accessible to all, this newly established pocket park represents Carnegie Museum of Art's continuing commitment to families, to exploration, and to creative imagination setting the stage for new ways of thinking about contemporary art and the museum. This commitment will be expressed in greater depth during the museum's summer architecture camp at the Heinz Architectural Center, which will be set against the backdrop of the playground project, a richly illustrated exhibition on the history of post-war playgrounds. Children participating in the camps will have the opportunity to respond to inspiring sites from around the world designing their own playground. The playground project will be on view for museum visitors from June 10th to August 23rd, 2013, and then October 4th to March 16th, 2014. Cases of thyroid cancer are on the rise, and the need for more research into the disease is critical. Christopher went to the Hillman Cancer Center to meet a cancer survivor who was paying it forward. Well, in 2009, I found out I had thyroid cancer, and I had never heard of thyroid cancer. So after I went through all my uh, treatments and everything, I told my family I was going to do something to make people aware of thyroid cancer. So the thyroid gland is a small butterfly-shaped gland. It lives in the neck right around where the knot of a necktie would be. Um, it's shaped sort of like a butterfly or a bow tie. And what the thyroid gland does is it controls all the metabolism and all the metabolic processes in the body. Detecting it is very hard. It usually starts with like a lump in your neck and then it, um, it attaches to your thyroid and then it grows. As far as thyroid disease, it's very, very hard to detect thyroid disease because it masks so many different things. 
Um, I was 14 years with Hashimoto's disease, but nobody knew until I had cancer. So that's how I was detected in that time. Then I found out I, I had Hashimoto's. And uh, what that is, is it's an autoimmune disease and it actually attacks your thyroid and it's killing your thyroid, so it does not work. So the rest of your body is just completely in like limbo because the thyroid regulates your entire body. Well, the types of treatment available for thyroid cancer usually start with surgery and surgical removal of the thyroid cancer and all affected thyroid uh, lymph nodes, perithyroidal lymph nodes. Um, and then based on the extent of cancer, radioactive iodine may be considered. Radioactive iodine is concentrated in thyroid cancer and thyroid tissue and destroys that tissue. And if there's any residual cancer left behind, the hope is that radioactive iodine will destroy the residual cancer. The fact is for the vast majority of patients who have a total thyroidectomy, they do extremely well after the operation. The thyroid hormone that they need is given back in the form of a pill that they take daily. It's an easy pill to take in the sense that if you forget a dose or you take an extra dose by mistake, it's usually not that big a deal. Treatment, the, the best thing is to find the best doctor to treat you and have a doctor that's gonna listen to you of what your symptoms are and not just look at your levels. And that's what I try to tell everybody. If you believe you have a thyroid condition, have the full thyroid panel checked along with your adrenals. And then that way you'll be better to detect if you have thyroid disease. Well, thyroid cancer is certainly on the rise nationally. It's the fastest growing cancer in uh, women and a rapidly growing cancer in men. And in fact, it's one of the few cancers that still continues to tick upward, a trend upward in terms of its frequency. So I would say the main um, thrust of research in thyroid cancer is in diagnostic and therapeutic molecular testing, molecular genetics. The idea being that we can learn a lot about a thyroid cancer based on understanding the genes that are present in a tumor. There's also a very rapidly growing field of therapeutic molecular diagnostics and molecular uh, genotyping. And the idea there is that we can better match specific treatments for specific kinds of cancer, again based on the identifiable molecular targets in a tumor. On an increasing basis, the identified genes in those cancers provide the target for those molecules or their systemic chemotherapies so we can better and more exactly match the kind of therapy that we're giving to the specific genetic type of cancer that a patient may have. Historically, we've had to piggyback thyroid cancer research on the back of research done for other cancers. And we've made some um, quite impressive and important gains with that kind of a model. Um, we're all very excited that this age of molecular genetic testing is growing because it's giving us increasing information about the thyroid cancers that we're treating in our patients and more options for better treatment for, for those patients. Thyroid cancer funding is not a top national priority. It affects a small um, but very well identified group of patients. And I think the fact is unless we can get those patients and their families, their corporations, their businesses to underwrite further research, research will continue to take a back seat to the other genetic research that's going on for other cancers. And we'll continue to be sort of you know, behind the eight ball when it comes to offering new and cutting edge therapies for, for thyroid cancer. I founded the group Butterfly Bandits. Our goal is to bring awareness um, in detecting thyroid disease and thyroid cancer and how people can prevent it. I have a lot of educational things that I hand out, you know, things to avoid so people do not have a problem with thyroid disease. And now we're doing a big event, which is gonna be March 21st at Kane Saloon and all the money will go to UPMC. I have a local band, which their name is called Local. Uh, they're a Pittsburgh acoustic band. Um, they play all kind of different kind of music. The Pirate Par Parrot is also going to be visiting us and, and then dancing and having a good time, bringing smiles. So it's going to be awesome. And Kane Saloon is going to be providing all the appetizers and um, bringing in all the desserts. And then we also have Massage Envy. And they're going to be coming in and they're going to bring their therapist. They're going to be doing many massages and many facials. So, and then I have awesome Chinese auction items and silent auction items. We have an autographed uh, penguin jersey and we have an autographed Steeler football. So it should bring in a lot of money and the money is going to be uh, used for beneficial for thyroid cancer research. I have a Facebook page. 
It's uh, facebook.com slash butterfly bandits. It's the fear of many people, a catastrophic event that makes it harder to meet your obligations. For a student, it can mean the difference of staying in school or not. St. Vincent College has created a safety net for its students. Here's how it works. The emergency fund is for students who find themselves in an emergency where they need money and what they would do is they would submit their claim to campus ministry to Father Killian and a committee will meet together and um, talk about like how we can help them and see if we can provide the funding for the emergency that's come up. I had a friend at the beginning of last semester get into a, a pretty serious accident and um, was met with the decision between staying in school and paying medical bills and it's not the first time that I've seen students experience something like that and it just seemed like there should be something there to help them. If something comes out of the blue, whether it be a family emergency or some sort of um, maybe a bill that they need to take care of, uh, th then uh, they can contact us and um, if it's an appropriate situation we're going to help them out as much as we can. I think it's important because it shows the students that we care and that we're more than just a school with glasses. We're here for you if you need us to be here and that we want to help you. It's an easy way to give back um, to help people who are really in need, um, in short term need as well. And um, it helps them to get an education to really work in their lives to help other people, so it's, it's really an easy way to give back tenfold. When, when things happen, you have an organization that cares enough to make sure that they can get you back on your feet so that you're not set back by whatever has unexpectedly come up. Juan de Marcos and the Afro-Cuban All-Stars, the 15-piece powerhouse orchestra that rarely makes their way to the United States, will appear in Pittsburgh at the August Wilson Center as part of African American culture in Pittsburgh on March 21st, 2013. Juan de Marcos is best known for his creation of the Bueno Vista Social Club, a Grammy award-winning album and Oscar-nominated film. Pittsburgh has a rich cultural and performance history, and de Marcos is excited to be a part of it. Check out the link on your screen for information on the Pittsburgh show. The Ohio River Trail Council invites you to be among the first to explore the Ohio River Water Trail Map and Guide, along with the results of the Ohio River North and South Shore Trail Feasibility Studies and the Brownfield Reuse Planning in Aliquippa, Coriopolis, Midland, and Manaca. You can check it out at the Community College of Beaver County on March 28th from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. in room 9103 and find more information on their Facebook event. You might have recognized story tags and Twitter handles after our stories. We invite you to continue the conversation by tagging the nonprofit using the story tag on Twitter. You can also get in touch with us on Twitter at PGH on video or hashtag unsung pgh as always thank you for watching unsung please be sure to share it with your friends you can check out our previous episodes and our unsung uncut series on pittsburghonvideo.org got a nonprofit you think is cool let us know why and you might just find yourself here on unsung you can email chris at whitlatchc at pghfdn.org as always I've been your host, Anthony Walker, reminding you to keep it awesome, Pittsburgh. We'll see you next time. I'm going to go take a stroll through the shops. So I said I'm going to crush it. Call me the golden boy because it shine whenever I touch it. Don't rush it. The flow comes naturally. Actually, the whole hood after me. Masterpiece, I outran a pace car.